and welcome to another Turning Point. My name is Muyu and it's great to be with you again. Now, whether you're married or hope to get married someday, today's show is an absolute must-see. Coming up, pornography, affairs, and call girls. A husband feeds his addiction any way he can. Find out what happens when his wife discovers his secret. But first, let's meet the author of the best-selling book, His Needs, Her Needs, Building a Fear-Proof Marriage, and his wife, who is co-host of the show, which is heard around the world. Please welcome my special guests, Dr. Bill and Joyce Harley. Welcome to the show. Good to Thank be you. With you. Glad to be yes. with you. It's, it's great to have you on the show. Now, I have to ask you, in this day and age where there's so many books about relationships, about marriage, uh, what makes this book different? Yeah, I wrote the book at a time when uh, the feminists were in charge of things <laughs> and they still I made well <laughs> I made a point mm -hmm. that was very controversial and that is that the emotional needs of men are very very different than the emotional needs of women and in marriage if you try to do things that you would appreciate yourself mm -hmm. you're going to miss the mark and so you need to learn to do something that um, you might not need as much and you might not appreciate as much, but in order to have a great marriage, you have to become an expert mm -hmm. at doing that. Now, Joyce, let me ask you, when your husband was writing the book, because, I mean, the book has been around for, for a while, and it's, 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 it's oh, been revised. Oh, 27 years now, right. And it's, yeah. still, it's still selling so well. Right. When he first wrote it, did, did he ask you and say, I want to write this, and, and did you say, oh, yeah, go ahead, or you thought, no. Oh, absolutely, go ahead, yes, because I knew how it was going to be helpful to mm. others, because the concept works, and uh, I knew that it would be a benefit to married couples out there, so we were in agreement on this one. Okay. So you talk about the concept, Do Doctor, let me come to you, uh, his needs and her needs, what are his needs, and of course, I don't want to give away everything, because I hope they'll buy your book after this, no, but what okay. are his They're... needs and what are her needs? Yeah, no, the, uh, his needs, <clears throat> first of all, I have to make a point and that is that everybody's different and so I tell everybody that reads the book you tell your spouse what your needs are don't I'm not gonna tell you what your needs are I don't want you to tell your spouse what I think I want you to tell them what you think so on average the average man's needs are sexual fulfillment which should be no surprise and <laughs> recreational companionship mm -hmm. he wants her to look good look good he wants an attractive wife. He wants domestic support, which is not too common these days. And he wants admiration, mm -hmm. which I think most men recognize. A woman, on the other hand, if she is to list the most important things that he can do for her, mm -hmm. is going to come up with a very different list. She is going to want affection. She wants what I call intimate conversation. The conversation is personal interesting about each other she's going to want honesty and openness that's a separate need she wants him to be completely transparent to her she wants financial support she wants him to have a job and she wants family commitment she wants him to be a good father she wants him to be a role model for the children he wants she wants him to train them in the values that will make them successful in life. All right. Now, let me come, come to you, Joyce, because um, I, I did wonder when looking at the book uh, how the impact of culture makes a difference. Is, is it the same for a woman in America as in Bahrain, as in you know, Tripoli, as in Nigeria? Yes. We are human beings. Now, culture may affect what you think you should want. But deep down inside, we are made, God made us this way, to uh, be drawn to each other, man and woman, and get out of each other what we need. And I feel that, uh, look at the women's list. In any part of the world, who doesn't want to have conversation with the man they love? <laughs> who doesn't want to be affectionate? Hugs and kisses. It's not sex. It's what can lead to sex, but it is not sex. But the affectionate aspect, who doesn't want that? No matter where you live. And then openness and honesty. Who wants to live with a liar? 
what whatever country you're in. You see my point. Yes. So it continues on around the world. Absolutely, it's applicable to anybody if you are a human being made of God. Uh, let me ask you though, Doc, uh, because um, uh, hearing from George Barner, who's uh, an author, an American author himself, uh, writing one of his uh, his biggest selling books, which talks about parenting, he says that he he looked at his own uh, deficiencies and thought. I can't write this book and there's so much out there already. Did you have that sort of struggle when you were going to write the book thinking, can I actually write about this? Am I qualified to write about this? It fell into my lap. <clears throat> actually, it, <clears throat> it was a Sunday school class. And somebody, trans somebody taped it. Mm -hmm. And then it was transcribed. It was, it was typed up. And that typed up Sunday school class found its way to the Fleming H. Ravel Publishing Company. They wanted to publish it. The rest is history. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I find out when we come back why my guest says in his book, it happened to me. That's here on Turning Point. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, we're in the studio with best-selling author Dr. Bill Harley and his lovely wife, Joyce. Uh, I have to say before we go any further, I love that jacket, Joyce. You know, oh, yes. It's, it's, do they make it for men? <laughs> <laughs> I think Ralph Lauren does, actually. <laughs> right. Obviously, the book is selling well. Your wife no, is no, shopping. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in your book, the, there's a part of it where you, you talk about, uh, it's, it's called, the title is called, um, It Happened to Me. Now, you start talking about your love for chess and giving that up so you can do, do an activity with your wife, and then you discovered that actually uh, she wasn't that keen on Well, that chess and tennis, actually, when we were dating, um, I, I, I was a, a chess champion, actually, oh, wow. and, um, my, uh, and we played tennis together as a couple, and Joyce was just fine with all of that. <laughs> and then when we were married, um, I found that the time that I was spending playing chess didn't give me enough time to be with her and certainly not enough time later on to be with my family um, and she told me she didn't like tennis <laughs> she didn't want to play tennis but and I said you know but why didn't you tell me this before I was, going to say, I, was, I was going to say why does that why does that happen I mean you knew he loved chess he was a chess champion and then you come into his life and take chess away no, from him what's wrong with you yeah, she, she didn't actually take it away from me she didn't take away anything what she did was she made it clear to me that this wasn't her favorite thing and so we d we made a very important decision at that point which was okay if that's something that you don't particularly care for or if it's interfering with other priorities in our lives mm. Let's work together to find something that would work for both of us. Right. So we took up volleyball, uh, couples volleyball. I mean, we did things that we could both enjoy, that we could both participate in. We both looked forward to. You she had wasn't just doing so much it. time together. She wasn't doing yeah. it just for me. We were yeah. doing it for each other. How, how important is that in the discussion of, of, of making your marriage an, a fair proof? Well, you have things in common. You're meeting each other's needs during that time together. Mm -hmm. And we call it the policy of joint agreement, where you come to an understanding and you both are happy with the decision. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case of chess, um, I did not play chess. Bill played it beautifully. Um, he probably would have been willing to teach me, but I just wasn't interested in it. Sorry, hon. And you I, know? Started, I started when I was four, so it was Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I had an advantage. <laughs> yes, right. I just pretend. <laughs> and so why should he take the time away from our time together? Well, you know, think of, too, if I had something like I was an avid shopper, you know, and it, he would not go with me because it was not something he enjoyed. That would be why painful. 
That would be painful. <laughs> so why should he be doing that? So the idea is to find mutuality. Right. Find something that you come together on and you can grow in together and you both will enjoy. And there's a lot of choices out there. The, the trick is you have to meet the emotional need. Mm -hmm. that, that to me is an essential part of marriage. You have to meet each other's important emotional needs. But you have to do it in a way that is enjoyable to the person meeting the need. Mm -hmm. And that's tricky. I mean, it requires a lot of conversation, it requires a lot of understanding. Uh, but you don't just meet the need at all costs. You meet it in, a, in, in an intelligent way, and you meet it in a way that can be sustained for the rest of your life. Right. If you do something that is purely sacrificial, sooner or later, you're going to quit doing it. Right. Whereas right. if you do it in an enjoyable way, you both will benefit from it for the rest of your life. It'll become part of your lifestyle. Now, you know, our, our time is so far spent. I wish we had two hours just to explore the subjects of your book, because clearly it's something that's, that's pertinent. I mean, the book has been going for, for two decades and still going strong. But a question of affairs, uh, you both have dealt with many people, counseled people, over the years and seen different scenarios, at what stage does an affair actually start? Mm -hmm. It starts Good surprisingly question. enough as a friendship. Yeah. If you have a friendship with somebody of the opposite sex, mo most people don't go looking for an affair. Most people work with somebody that they de de develop a friendship for and then that friend in my nomenclature makes huge love bank deposits. And without them really th understanding what's going on, they become increasingly attracted to this other person until they end up being in love. It starts as a friendship in conversation that tends to start getting personal of the op with someone of the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. A woman called us on the radio show. She's a Christian. She said, I'm a Christian. I love my husband, but I am also in love with a man at work. And all we are doing is talking. Wow. And it's, it's insidious. It's insidious. And that's why we, we encourage people to get safeguards in place. There are precautions to take because, once again, we're wired. Mm -hmm. And the sooner we realize that, the safer we will be in our marriages. People say we're ridiculous in, in the requirements that we set for marriage. Mm -hmm. We don't want you to have a friend of the opposite sex where the friendship is personal. They say that's ridiculous. In our, in our society, you've got to have friends like that. And I say, an affair is worse than cancer. Wouldn't you take precautions to avoid cancer? Mm -hmm. Well, in infidelity, infidelity is 60% chance that in your marriage you'll have an affair, 60%. Shouldn't you take precautions? I have just, just about 20 seconds left, and I wonder, is there one last word you could say for someone who's watching, who's, who's thinking, there might be an affair going on, what do I do? Do you have a friend who you find so attractive that you'd rather talk to that friend of the opposite sex than your spouse? Don't talk to that person again. Well, Don't stay with us. To that person again. We'd love to hear some more <laughs> from you. Now, what would you do if you discovered your spouse was not only having an affair, but was keeping records of their sexual encounters? You'd be surprised what the woman in our next story did when we come back. Everything seemed normal for Mr. and Mrs. Allen, but when she found records kept by him of places, times, and the many women he had been with, their world came crashing down. When Amy Allen went snooping through her husband Tim's office files, what she found broke her heart. And he'd written pages of different prostitutes, their names, all their stats, and how to get a hold of them, and then. Um, some he had written, like what he'd done with some of them. Oh and that was crushing. I said, I'm out of here. I can't deal with this anymore. What I came back to was 
an empty house with her wedding ring sitting on the mantle at the house and realize that it's over. Tim's secret sex addiction had finally come to light, and his marriage to Amy was over. It all started in his childhood. Pornography had been in my life since I was about nine, probably even before that. Um, Playboy, my grandparents, my grandfather had it, and I looked for it all the time when I was down there. Tim's addiction to porn only increased as he got older. Unfortunately, after he married Amy, he began playing out his fantasies with other women. That pornography stuff in magazines is not enough anymore. That was actually something different and interesting. I want more of that. At home, Amy knew something was wrong in their relationship, but couldn't quite figure it out. I just didn't feel like he didn't even want to be with me. I felt like his ball and chain at times. As the internet grew in popularity, Tim's lust for outside sex grew out of control. Tim developed an ongoing relationship with the woman that he met on the web. Amy found out when she discovered condoms in a bag they both shared. I confronted him and I screamed at him and I was yelling at him and screaming obscenities and saying, why are you doing this to us? What's wrong with you? I packed some bags and took it down to his office that day and put him in his truck. I'm about ready to throw away everything since we've met, everything that I've worked for, for an affair that I've had with this young woman who I don't even really like, but it was sex and that still had its tentacles on me. Eventually, Amy and Tim tried to salvage their marriage and Tim moved back home. They started going to church, but Tim's mind was elsewhere. He still craved sex. You get on the internet and you see escorts and prostitutes and whatever you want to call them offering what I wanted for money. No, you know, no strings attached. Tim cruised the city streets, massage parlors, and the internet to set up rendezvous with prostitutes. That's when Amy found his files in their home office. Some of the stuff she was reading was you know, horrible. But I had put it down and she had found it and packed everything up and left. Amy moved back home with her mom. She started attending church and accepted Christ as her savior. God was helping me to see him through his eyes and that we're all sinners. Tim was at his lowest point. His marriage was over and his life was at a crossroads. He started reading Christian books on sexual addiction. I was raised in the church. I mean, well, what does this have to tell me about myself? I knew there was probably something wrong because one half of my life has just come crashing down of a foundation I thought I had. Then, on their eighth wedding anniversary, Amy gave Tim a call. We'd both filed for divorce. He filed in Maryland and I filed in San Diego. And so there was nothing to lose. So we were very, very open and honest with each other and our feelings, our true feelings. She started talking to me about still loving me, which hurt. I didn't want to hear that, but at the same time, it, it, it was impacting me. Um, you know, how can she still love me? That was part of what I was asking myself at the time. She also read some scripture to me about, you know, sin is sin. Tim couldn't get Amy's words out of his mind. He finally cried out to God for help. And I just kept reading all this stuff and all, you know, who he was and what he did. Jesus is who he says he is. And I broke down in the basement of a house in Maryland. And he said, if you are who you are, you have to help me. If you're God, if you are who you say you are, help. Tim found a church and met with the pastor and opened up to him about it and just felt and knew that I could trust him and he would be open and you know would pray and would support in any way he possibly could. Amy and Tim began to talk. As they grew in their faith, they decided to meet. I gave her her ring back and told her that I was sorry and told her that, you know, the things I had done, are, they're unforgivable. I, but I'm following Jesus. I was afraid because I didn't want it to happen again. God's voice was stronger to me than anyone else's. As my parents said, don't go back with him. His parents said, don't go back with him. But I knew what God was telling me. 
and uh, I listened to his voice, and I'm glad I did. Their love for each other has grown, and Tim and Amy now have two daughters. The growing that we are doing and the, the intimacy that we are now sharing and where the Lord is continuing to bring us back is something I never understood. And it's, it, it is a wonderful thing. It takes time, and it takes forgiveness over and over, and it takes agape love, His kind of love for each other. It's something only He can do. I mean, we are together because of Jesus. Dr. Harley, Mr. Harley, thank you so much for staying with us. Now, having watched that story, I wonder what your thoughts are, uh, both of you. And uh, we're talking about making your marriage a, a fair proof. But here's a man who's gone off into the seedy world of, of all sorts. His wife discovers. Uh, what is it that makes a man go off and do that? Is it just that he's not getting his sexual need met at home? Well, that might be part of it, but the, the true story is that most men have what I call a secret second life. And uh, they compartmentalize their lives into parallel tracks. One is their marriage and their family, and then they have their own independent life that is going on without the knowledge of, of their wife or and children. This is typically a man thing? More men than women tend to do this. Um, and so what happens is that they can actually develop a lifestyle independently of their wife that is innocent at first. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily have anything to do with sex. Uh, it would just be things that he doesn't explain to her, doesn't tell her what he's doing. He thinks that he has a right to privacy. Right. Uh, we strongly object to that whole approach to marriage. We feel that marriages should be completely transparent. Everything that he does should be made known to his wife for her protection, for her protection. Because there's a lot of things that he can do that would hurt her if she knew about it. So if you tell her ahead of time, she's going to say, no way, I'm not going to have you do any of that stuff. And it never happens. But Joyce, let me ask you though, and, and I'm asking you knowing that your ministry reaches right across the world. Yes. It's not just in America, right. in the West Indies, in Europe, in, in, in Asia. Uh, so you have a, a good view on global things. For, for people who are or women who are in a culture where it's not the done thing really for, for the man to be, you know, to be telling you what he's doing, you know, how, do you, how do you get through that? Because you know, you, you're just told by everyone around you, everything around you, that it's not your place. Just be quiet, woman. That's a hard one. It truly is. Because like you say, it's a cultural thing. Your parents did it, your grandparents did it this way, etc. But we're in a new age right now. And if somebody watching right now is saying, I don't want to live this way any longer, to me, I would recommend that they go to their spouse. It could be a man that's feeling this way, as well as a woman. You addressed a woman, so we'll go there. Go to your husband and say, I'm stifled. I want to love you more. I want you to love me more. I want us to become bonded. I want us to be interdependent, not independent of each other. I don't want a dictatorship. I want a democracy. Can we talk about this? And maybe in your own home, in the midst of everything else going on around you, you can have what your heart's desire has been. Mm -hmm. You know the Lord, you pray about that too. Soften the heart of my spouse that they will understand what is truly God's will for our marriage. And that is that we care for each other and meet each other's needs. I had an email from somebody in China who told me that in our culture, uh, men are, are, are not supposed to be open with their wives. We, we, we don't reveal our inner thoughts. And I said, well, people don't do that here in America either. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what I'm recommending is something that needs to be done in all cultures, but in all cultures it's difficult to do. Let me ask you, though, because um, in this day and age you read about marriages breaking down. It's, it's, it happens to the best of them, you know, actors, people who are who uh, people, who, people idolize them and look and, and see that's the example to follow. And all of a sudden you find out it's, it's all falling apart. Uh, the story of the Allens and how they came back together, 
uh, seems like an unusual thing, doesn't really happen. Uh, is it common? And, and is it's, it it's very common right. because of the constraints in marriage. In other words, there's a lot of reasons not to get married. And, and what he did was devastating to his wife. But she wanted somehow for it to work out. She did the right thing to have left him when wow. she found out about it. She did exactly the right thing. And then he did the right thing by deciding that his, what, what he was getting out of his uh, sexual experiences was not worth the marriage. So he comes back into the marriage. But he didn't create enough precautions the first time mm. to end it once and for all. I would assume that now he's done that. He's accomplished it. And he's done it through the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the Lord gave him an incentive that he didn't have before. Mm -hmm. He was able to know that now I'm, I'm not doing it just for my wife now. I'm doing it for the Lord. The Lord will bless me in my commitment to him in this particular way that I am behaving. And, and the combination of it made their marriage work. Yes. Now you speak of the power of the Holy Spirit and, and uh, the likes. And, and I wonder if uh, both of you would pray uh, right now for someone who's watching who may be going through this or it's, it's looming and they don't see it coming uh, if you'd be so kind and pray for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Our God and our Heavenly Father we thank you for the privilege of coming to your throne because of your Son Jesus Christ. You hear all, you know all and you love us all. And Father I pray for those viewing that have hurts and hardships in their marriage and pains and sufferings Father, I pray that you will reach out and you will touch them. Lead them to understanding of what can turn this around through your power. And we will give you all the honor and all the glory. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the power that we have through your spirit. Thank you for the guidance that you give us. There's someone listening right now, someone watching, who needs your power. Grant him the help that he needs to avoid the temptations that he or she is experiencing at work or with a neighbor or with a friend. Help them to separate from that person to live their lives in a way that would be honorable to you because we give you all of the honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, let me just say, wherever you are, whatever country you're in, if you find that you need some help in your relationship, in your marriage, you're not alone. You can go to the website on your screen now. My guests have an organization where they've helped thousands of people. Millions of people go through their website. You're not the only one. And we look forward to hearing from you. Till we meet again, Madame, Monsieur, Ma Chérie, au revoir. God bless.